Good morning and welcome to our workshop on longitudinal data. My name is Beate Lichtwart and my colleague James Rayner and I will be um, running this workshop for you today. The roadmap for today looks as follows. We will first have some Mentimeter time. You will then hear an introduction to the UK data service, but just a short version to give you some background information. We will then focus on what longitudinal data are available via the UK data service. And the next session uh, will then focus on where would you find the data? How would you go about accessing the data? And most importantly, where do you find resources to get started and help if you get stuck? And in the end, we have a hands-on practical. You saw it in the course description. We will then have a practical bit and you're very welcome uh, to do these exercises. And we will give um, comments and hints and guidance on that. Now, before we start with the presentation, Mentimeter time, and I'm handing over to James. Yeah, so we're just going to start with uh, some Mentimeter, just a little online quiz. I run the questions now, it should appear at the top of the screen. Um, so if you just join at menti.com, I use this code 6991-2950. Uh, You'll be able to answer um, these questions we've got. So the first question we've got today, so is um, what do you associate with longitudinal data? So when you think of longitudinal data, um, what comes to mind? <clears throat> So we've got a few answers already. So we've got um, well, we've got a few. It's good to see quite a lot of answers appearing. Um, yeah, repeated measures, panels data, uh, repeated cohort study. Um, some answers in there. Not sure what what longitudinal data is. That's fine. Um, good to see you here today. So you get more of an understanding um, about following following data over long periods of time, long term studies. Um, Time series difficult to get hold of. Yes, it can be. Um, yeah, great. So it's quite a good mix of you know understand levels in there, and yeah, I'd agree with sort of most of the most of the responses we received are uh, still still going up. So twenty nine responses, which is quite good. Um, Yeah, thank you. Thank you to all those who answered um, during that session. Uh, question, sorry. Uh, moving on to the second question we have. Uh, what research topic are you interested in? So I want to know sort of what area of, uh, you know, research background you come from. Um, why are you looking to do longitudinal data? What area of longitudinal data you sort of want to want to research? You may be looking at sort of health or, yeah, labour economics. So really, we've got quite a few. We've got um, health's quite a big one there. Household economics, disabilities, um, education, inequality, ethnicity. Um, no, yes, really good. <clears throat> I thank you all for answering really quickly as well. It's probably one of the better um, sort of responses on Intermeter that we've we've had. Um, It just shows that longitudinal data, there's obviously loads of different uses you can use it for, loads of different research topics um, that can be can be used. Um, long, longitudinal data can probably be used to research a majority of these things. Um, yeah, thank you um, for those responses. Uh, just moving on to our third and final question then. Um, so it's just a bit of a multiple choice question. Um, so we've got three questions, sort of research questions here. Um, we want to know 
which of these do you think cannot be um, explored using longitudinal data? And it's maybe a bit subjective, but so the first question is, are people's chosen career path influenced by their parents' occupations? Uh, can that be explored with longitudinal data? How an individual's economic circumstances affect their mental health? Or is CBT an effective treatment for depression? So which one of these cannot be explored out of the three? Which one would you say probably you might not be able to do as well using longitudinal data? Yes, yeah, so we've got a good mix of answers there. Um, most of you answered the third third one. So is CBT an effective treatment for depression? So I think, yeah, this is what we would say you probably couldn't um, be able to explore as well using longitudinal data compared to the other two, where you've got sort of uh, people's chosen career path influenced by their parents' occupations. That's something you could look at. Uh, if you're looking at a cohort study, um, you, you would obviously have data on um, parents' occupations as well as sort of future, what, what the cohort members would study or um, have as their occupation. And then uh, for the second one, um, how does an individual's economic circumstance affect their health? And um, that's something you could look at over time um, in a longitudinal study and different um, health conditions and circ uh, economic circumstances. Whereas this third one is CBT an effective treatment for depression. Um, you may you may need to look at that in some sort of different study, maybe a clinical trial or something. Um, explore that in a different way rather than sort of a longitudinal study. Um, so that's sort of generally what we were looking for there. Um, so that takes us to the end of the little Mentimeter questions. Thank you all for your participation. That was good, uh, good responses uh, from that. So now we're just going to continue um, with the main presentation again. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And hand you back to Biart now. Okay, so we will now start with the introduction to the UK data service. That was very informative, what you answered, and I think we can use that um, as we go along for whatever comes, and we will refer to that. Thank you very much for all your responses. So what is the UK data service? Um, the UK data service is a comprehensive resource funded by the ESRC. It's a single point of access to a wide range of secondary social science data, and how wide range that is, you will see in a moment. We do not only provide data, but also support, training, and guidance. And uh, we have provided here the URL for our website. Uh, and this is a bit of our website, which you can see there. Um, and you see on the left-hand side in the very corner, find data, a very important uh, thing to click on. However, before we continue, just um, a reminder all the slides and the recording of this event will be available afterwards. Um, when you go to our webpage, um, training and events, and this was upcoming coming events uh, so far, but it will be previous events when we have uploaded the um, slides and the recording. This is where you can find all the materials. So you don't need to scribble everything down. You can access it afterwards. Now, who is the UK Data Service for? It is for academic researchers and students, for government analysts, for charities and foundations, for business consultants, for independent research centers, and for think tanks. And where do the data sources come from? Well, mainly from central government official agencies. That's one source, so like the Office for National Statistics, for example. We have also international statistical time series data but also individual academics uh, data. So what that is, is um, if as a researcher, you have a research grant, let's say from the ESRC, for example, um, part of the conditions uh, is that you have to deposit the data three months after you finished your project with us and make it available for secondary research. So we have those data sets as well. We have data from market research agencies. We hold public records um, from historical sources. And we have access to international data via links with other data archives worldwide. The types of data collections that we hold are first, survey microdata, so cross-sectional data, panel longitudinal data, international microdata. Second, aggregate statistics, international macrodata. 
third census data. And here we hold accurate data, flow data, microdata, and boundary data. And fourth, we have qualitative and mixed methods data. And what I mean by that is in depth interview transcripts, diaries, anthropological field notes, answers to open ended surveys, um, audio visual recordings, and images. So, quite um, a wide range of data types. A different way of uh, saying what we hold is uh, looking at these different um, so, uh, types of data again, but in, in a different way. So UK service, longitudinal data, international data, qualitative data, census business, administrative data, and also controlled international microdata. And uh, on the right hand side, you can see a little bit what that all contains. I would actually, um, like to highlight the controlled international microdata as well. So we hold in our safe room um, secure access data from the IRB in Germany, from CSD France, and from GISES from Germany, uh, which can be accessed. This is possible via our membership in the International Data Access Network. This is a project of six research data centers from France, Germany, Netherlands, and the United Kingdom. And the aim here is to facilitate research use of controlled access data between these RDCs. So just to give you an idea of the scope, um, the UK Data Service holds almost 9,500 studies. The majority are safeguarded data, so that are 7,690. And what that means is that after an initial process of registration, you can access the data and you can actually download the data to your um, desktop and you can analyze the data. Then we have open data and we have controlled data or controlled access data. And here two different types. So the main type is remotely accessible secure lab data. Um, and then we have a very few studies that you can only access in our safe room. James will talk a lot about access conditions a bit more later on, but just to give you a first idea of um, what sort of access level the data are coming with. So we have open, safeguarded, and controlled data. Um, open, I don't need to explain. Uh, safeguarded, as I said, you need to um, basically do an online registration process, and you need to also agree to the end user license, but that can all be done online. And uh, the controlled data, so secure lab data access data, they require a longer application process of approximately three months. And you need to um, go through an application process that entails also a safe researcher training uh, bit. And you need to also pass a test for that before you're allowed to access the data. Now, we are coming to the actual topic of today's workshop, and that's longitudinal data. So longitudinal surveys involve repeated surveys of the same individuals at different points in time. And you have said that actually in the beginning in, in the Mentimeter exercise, I have seen that you also answered that it's repeated surveys. Um, so, so you know roughly what it is but very important and it actually gives you fantastic um, opportunities in terms of then uh, causality analysis and we will come to that uh, later on as well. So these longitudinal data that we hold are large sample data, they are nationally representative and um, also like in every longitudinal study there is a issue of attrition uh, as you can imagine, but the teams are usually doing quite a fantastic job of keeping numbers up by adding um, regularly new respondents and also by keeping the old respondents happy and um, contact them regularly so not to lose anyone. It's possible that sometimes um, in some sweeps respondents might not be able to answer and then come back and answer in the next sweep again. So. Longitudinal data allows a researcher to analyze change at an individual level and also to look into causation. And I've seen that again in the Mentimeter exercise. I was very happy to see that, yes, it is also about causation and it's very important. Um, and, and longitudinal data allow um, especially for analysis of that. So 
You can study, for example, the effect of different life events on, for example, health or the outcome of certain illnesses on other aspects of life, for example, education or employment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, although the data are a little bit more complex to manage, you will have seen that once you downloaded the data. Um, there is a lot of uh, material out there on our website, but also on other websites, for example, Closer, and I will refer to that later, um, which will actually help you very practically to manage and analyze the data and to get started. So don't be afraid of the more complex nature of the data. To give you an idea of sort of the sort of data sets that we hold and make available when it comes to longitudinal data, here is a list um, of some uh, selected uh, studies. And I would like to start highlighting the cohort studies that we hold. They are all from the Center for Longitudinal Studies in London at the UCL. And these are the 1958 National Child Development Study, NCDS, 1970 British Cohort Study, BCS70, and the Millennium Cohort Study, MCS. And then when we jump down quite a bit to next steps, formerly the Longitudinal Study of Young People in England, um, they are now also housed by the um, CLS. Um, they fit into that as well. As you can see, there's quite a gap between the 1970s British cohort study and the millennium cohort study of almost 30 years. And the next step study um, with 1989-90 date fits quite nicely in between those two and uh, bridges the gap, if you wish. So we will look into the nature of these British cohort studies in a minute. First, I would like to then also highlight that we have the British Household Panel Survey and its successor Understanding Society or UK Household Longitudinal Study. It's two names for the same thing. It doesn't matter which one you use. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the same study. And um, this is the, the largest. I, you will see I have some details regarding that on, a, on a, one of the next slides. Um, it's a fantastic resource. We also have English Longitudinal Study of Aging. I also saw that you are interested in the uh, topic of aging, and that definitely um, will hold um, a whole wealth of information in, 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 this, uh, in these sweeps that we have and make available. Growing up in Scotland, as it says, particularly focuses on um, kids growing up in Scotland, very rich resource again, and then the cohort and longitudinal studies enhancement resources closer. The British uh, birth cohort studies basically look into the impact of childhood conditions on education, light, later life, health and economic circumstances, and basically aim to understand children and families in the UK. So just a few details regarding the three first mentioned um, uh, cohort studies. So they have quite a large sample size of 17,000 uh, for the NCDS and the 1970 BCS and 19,000 for the MCS. I have listed here the different ages at which the respondents were surveyed. And you can see that they obviously aim to survey the respondents at the same age. So it is actually comparable and we have inter-cohort comparability. Um, and they all look at a wide range of social, economic, health, medical and psychological issues. So. The National Child Development Study um, has become a unique resource for investigating social mobility and the impact of childhood conditions on later life. And there are the main surveys and the main sweeps, but there are also one, some with uh, specific, specific foci. So for example, there are uh, certain ones on focusing on partnership history, employment history, social participation, and identity, response and death, parent migration, behavioral studies, and essays. So that already highlights we do not hold only quantitative data for those studies, but also qualitative data. So um, this is quite a unique uh, resource combining both. And uh, we will elaborate on that later. The British cohort study then is very similar in design and coverage to the NCDS, obviously, because the whole point of that is comparability. 
And um, the, some of the recent sweeps use common questions, which is fantastic because then you have basically your ex ante harmonization and you don't need to afterwards invest so much time um, and effort to, to make the data comparable. So very important opportunities for inter-cohort comparisons here. And again, some of the data collections have a special focus on, for example, education, employment history, and others. In the Millennium Cohort study, um, the special focus was, for example, on mothers who received fertility treatment and on physical activity, and there was also a teacher survey. I would like to highlight regarding the MCS that they have actually looked into making it more appealing to those they are aiming to, to survey. So you can imagine that a 14 year old is not very happy to sit down with a paper and pen and complete a questionnaire. So what can you do to engage your, um, your respondents? And the CLS has come up with a fantastic idea. So they use a diary app and also an activity monitor. So MCS was the first large scale population study in the world to incorporate objective measurement of physical activity. And for that, they have actually used what is called an accelerometer. And they also used self-reported time use for the same period of time. And um, basically they have um, developed an online diary and a bespoke smartphone app to collect the data. And you can imagine this is much more appealing to, um, to the generation of 14 year olds and uh, also to actually go with time and, and make it relevant. And to also have an objective measure that can be compared with what was answered in the app, for example. Very interesting, very successful. Um, I just wanted to highlight that. So this is a snippet of the um, uh, website of the CLS. So please have a look yourself and, and see some more details. But basically here are all the four cohort studies that I've mentioned before, and you find a lot of details there. I would like to also highlight the COVID-19 service at the CLS. And that is because it's very, very impressive um, that when you think about the first lockdown um, having started in April 2020, that already by uh, May 2020, there were surveys underway to, um, to basically research the um, impact of COVID on people's lives. And so included are the four cohort studies, but also the MRC National Survey of Health and Development. Um, and in March 20, um, 2021, there were even blood samples um, taken from some of the participants to be analyzed for COVID-19 antibodies. So again, we had even biomedical measures for this particular survey. There's also a closer block on that, how the UK's longitudinal studies are helping society navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. So that was very impressive how quickly the response came from longitudinal surveys and also from others. Um, I will highlight that as we go along. So three waves have been completed for that COVID-19 survey. And um, the wave one done in, in May 2020 had already 18,000 participants. So that's the beauty of it. So if you wish, CLS could already use the infrastructure, the survey infrastructure that was in place to now quickly and very timely get insights into the lives of study participants, including their physical and mental health and well-being, family and relationships, education, work, finances during the first national lockdown. And actually, all these findings of the longitudinal studies have actually informed policy um, and, and decision making. So the, the second wave had the aim um, to capture how participants' uh, lives had changed from wave one until uh, the late summer, early autumn of 2020. And the topics of wave one were basically mirrored, but with additional questions about healthcare, financial transfers, life events, and children's schooling in summer and autumn term, because they were disrupted quite a lot as well, as schools closed for long periods of time. And then the third wave um, 
comprised questions included in the first and second waves, but then again, new additions, including questions about the vaccination program and long COVID, for example. We have a particular web page on our website um, listing all the COVID-19 data at the UK Data Service. And here I would like to, um, I have just yeah, screenshotted three. But the last one, again, I would like to highlight, when you look at that, the coverage from 23rd of April onwards, um, this is fantastic how quickly that um, that came about and how quickly basically understanding society reacted to what was going on. Um, just very impressive. Now, finally, some um, CLS studies outlook. So what's new? I would like to mention three new studies. One is the Children's of the 2020s um, study, which is a nationally representative birth cohort study of babies in England, which have been, and, and this study has been commissioned by the Department for Education. And the design is that um, the aim is to answer important scientific and policy questions regarding family, early education and childcare, determinants of early school success, and targeted are babies born in September to November 2021. So we're looking at 8,500 families and five waves. The second one is the Early Life Cohort Feasibility Study, which will be finalized in June 2024. And there's a website where you can actually uh, follow the outcome of that. And the third one is a COVID Social Mobility and Opportunity Study, COSMO, which is a national cohort study of more than 12,000 young people from across England. And here, very importantly, these were pupils um, in year 11 in the academic year 2020-2021. And this is a design to examine the short, medium and long-term impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the educational inequality and social mobility of that particular um, cohort. And the first data are already available, um, COVID social mobility and opportunity study wave one, why is the UK data service? Here, I would like to draw your attention to the content. So obviously, this study is there to cover the disruption to schooling during the pandemic. But then again, especially how that has affected young people's educational attainment and well-being in the long and in the short run. And following from that, obviously, the career outcomes. So whereas wave one, focused on experiences of the pandemic, financial impacts, disruption to schooling, access to home learning, attitudes to education, mental health and well-being, and a GCSE assessment in 2021. Wave two covered the activities since wave one, university applications, labor market and apprenticeship experiences, vocational training, and um, Again, core topics that are also covered in wave one, such as mental health and well-being. And very interesting, on the left-hand side of that uh, slide, you see the linkage. So the study was um, designed with linkage opportunities in mind um, to later on enable um, linkage to administrative data from the National Pupil Database, the Longitudinal Educational Outcomes Dataset, LEO, as well as other sources, such as um, participation in the National Tutoring Program, um, DWP, um, HM Revenue and Customs, Universities and Colleagues Admission Service, Higher Education Statistics Agency, and the Student Loans Company. So you can see in what direction that goes. And that's really amazing that so many resources are have already been in mind when designing that study so that actually there will be um, linkage opportunities. This is a really fantastic opportunity. Now, coming to Understanding Society or the UK Household Longitudinal Study, I had said that's the biggest one and you can see why I've said that. Um, it's a study of the socioeconomic circumstances and attitudes of 100,000 individuals in 40,000 British households. This is 
just incredible. And it replaces and incorporates a BHPS, which ran from 1991 to 2009. And you can see here the, uh, the scope. So in BHPS, you were looking at 5,500 households. Now in the Anasonic Society uh, survey, you're looking at um, 40,000 households. Now, so the Anasonic Society study replaces and incorporates BHPS. Um, it retains the longevity whilst adding to the sample size and the scope of the study. So there are new components, for example, an innovation panel, greater detail on ethnic minority groups, but also qualitative and biomedical data collections. In, in principle, the coverage includes employment, earnings, parenting, childcare, family networks, benefit payments, political party identification, household finances, environmental behaviors, and then also obviously uh, consent is thought for um, linking to administrative data, for example, regarding health and education. Just to highlight one um, health assessment, there was a nurse health assessment in wave two and three, and 20,000 adults gave um, biomedical measures, including blood pressure, weight, height, waist, body fat, grip strength, lung function, and blood samples. And this is uh, all in dataset SN 7251. And I would like to also draw your attention to the webinar that we have available on our website, which is called an introduction to survey data on biomarkers. Very often when social scientists uh, start looking um, into biomarker, um, available biomarkers, there is not much knowledge what can be used for what. So also the data depositor, the um, um, Institute for Social and Economic Research, ISA, um, has provided fantastic information on their website. And here you can see the URLs and also some snippets of what's available there on these web pages. Um, to give an overview um, on, on the biomarkers available in Understanding Society and their applications, which is very helpful. And also um, there is more information out there and, and small videos. So this is, this is actually very helpful and has enabled research um, that wasn't available for social scientists before, because there was maybe a bit of a lack of background knowledge on that. So data linkage, usually we are looking into linkages with geographical identifiers and administrative uh, data linkages, for example, when it comes to education, health, economic circumstances and transport and organizational linkages. What is really good news is that we already offer harmonized data sets. So we have, for example, 6614, which contains understanding society data, waves 1 to 13, 2009 to 22, and harmonized BHPS, waves 1 to 18, all in one data set. So that spares the researcher quite a lot of work to um, to, to, to harmonize the data themselves. It's, um, it's a very good opportunity. And then we have the secure access version of that as well. So all the latest waves are in there, updated files from previous waves, and also all 18 waves of PHPS, obviously. Now, Understanding Society, as we saw, uh, on the list uh, of our COVID studies, um, has a COVID-19 study as well. And that is a regular survey of households in the UK. And basically this is specifically to enable research on the socioeconomic health consequences of the pandemic. And you can have a look at that when you, if you're interested in that. So another study I would like to mention, you also said you are interested in the topic of aging. We have the English Longitudinal Study of Aging in our uh, collection. And here we have data from a representative sample of the population aged 50 plus in England um, on a range of indicators regarding well-being, economic circumstances, social participation and health. 
So 10 waves have been collected. And ELSA is, is a short version for that, is a longitudinal survey of aging and quality of life among older people that explores the dynamic relationships between health and functioning, social networks and participation and economic position as people plan for move into and progress beyond retirement. Well, why is that interesting? because and relevant because one in three people in England are now over 50 which means it's really important to understand what life is like for England's aging population and also last but not least ELSA helps the government uh, plan health care services and pension systems to best meet the needs of the growing population so summarizing the main objectives of ELSA are to construct waves of accessible and well-documented panel data to provide the data in a convenient and timely fashion to the scientific and policy research community and describe health trajectories, disability and healthy life expectancy in a representative sample of the English population aged 50 plus to examine the relationship between economic position and health, the determinants of economic position in older age the timing of retirement and post-retirement labor market activity, and also understands the relationships between social support, household structure, and the transfer of assets. Also, ELSA has a qualitative element. So there are transcripts of short essays, which are a result uh, of respondent answers to the following question. Thinking back over your life, with its wide variety of enjoyable as well as difficult experiences, please write about three aspects of your life that have been especially important to you and how they affected you. And that we have as 505 eight transcripts in the data collection. The topics that are covered in ELSA COVID-19 study, again, a particular COVID study, very quickly reacted again in 2020, um, looking into mental health, financial security, employment, financial situation, volunteering, physical health and health behaviors, social connection, isolation, and technological inclusion, very important during that time, income pensions and retirement. So fantastic source as well. There is an international um, platform out there, which is called Gateway to Global Aging Data. And I'm mentioning that because ELSA is actually feeding into that. So the aim of this uh, platform is to harmonize uh, aging data from different countries, and ELSA is also in there. We have um, another webinar on this particular issue. I have provided the URL here underneath the small box. Closer is an interdisciplinary partnership of leading social and biomedical longitudinal population studies, the UK Data Service and the British Library. Um, and the work areas that are covered by CLOSER are data discoverability, policy and dialogue, training and capacity building, and data innovations. There are different work packages um, harmonizing longitudinal data. So, just to mention some, Work Package 1, for example, focuses on harmonizing height, weight, and BMI in five longitudinal cohort studies. And uh, another one, just to pick another example here, Work Package 20, harmonizing mental health measures um, at age 10, 11 in selected British cohort studies. So again, there's lots of harmonizing work already done for the researchers to make it easier to, to access the data and utilize the richness of the data. And finally, I would like to introduce Growing Up in Scotland data, which follows several cohorts. And these are the cohorts 2002-3, 2-4-5, and 10-11 of the Scottish children from the early years uh, through their childhood and, and beyond. So they look at health, neighborhood, development, education, leisure, and friendships. And again, um, the parents are asked for consent to linkages to administrative data. The aim of the study is to provide information to support policy making, but it's also actually a broader resource that can be drawn on by academics 
voluntary sector organizations and other interested parties. So the fields of work here are cognitive, social, emotional and behavioral development, physical and mental health, childcare, parenting, family, community, networks, and involvement in offending and risky behavior. And there were just recently studies, um, especially looking into exactly the last point, involvement in offending and risky behavior um, at the transition phase from um, at, at the age of 11, the transition phase from primary to secondary school with very interesting findings. Now, this diagram is just here to illustrate quickly the sources of information that feed into GUS. So you have um, health and school records linked to it. You have the main interview, and then you have also biomedical measures, which you can see here in different colors. Impact, a very important and an increasingly important topic when it comes to not just longitudinal data, but data altogether. Um, so what sort of impact can we observe? And I would just like to highlight that using the example of GUS uh, growing up in Scotland. So regarding policy, for example, um, GUS contributed to the development of Scottish government policies and strategies. It has been referenced by politicians in parliamentary debates. It has been used by various organizations giving evidence to Scottish Parliament committees. It has been used by local authorities to inform strategic development, and it has been used by voluntary sector organizations to inform policy development. And in practical terms, it is used in discussions with nursery staff and parents, um, but also when it comes to informing targeting of support, funding applications, um, or used as a national benchmark against which to compare local outcomes, and also as evidence um, when it comes to improvements, so you can basically track it. So very, very relevant, and um, I don't have the time, unfortunately, to um, go more into that. It's a very interesting field, but just some more high highlights or headlines. Um, for example, understanding society data underpins child vaccine guidance. So here the chief medical officers refer to the research on school closures and children's difficulties and guidance to the health secretary during the pandemic. Or um, the think tank used understanding society to assess universal credit in the pandemic, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, invaluable resource. And the last one before I'm handing back to my colleague James. Um, there was a very alarming finding in the Millennium, based on the Millennium cohort study, that one fifth of the 11 year olds were not able to read well. And um, that basically 1.5 million British children um, at the age of 11 would be unable to read well. And this is a great concern because obviously um, at the transition phase from primary to secondary school, that means they cannot utilize um, what is on offer for them in terms of education and later in terms of employment um, if that basic skill is not there. But last not, but, but um, also the poor reading could cost the UK uh, 32 billion in growth by 2025. And several campaigns actually followed on from that and um, tried to improve reading abilities um, before it's basically too late. And that was very, very successful. And one of those was a read on get on campaign and there were others, but we don't have time now to focus on that, but just to mention it um, as one of the examples. Back to James. Okay, thank you, uh, Beata. Uh, so I'm just going to touch on a couple more examples of how um, you know impactful pieces of research are using longitudinal data. Uh, the first one I want to talk about was um, this piece of research using the Millennium Cohort Study. So this uh, research looked at adolescent mental health, and they found that uh, one in four 14-year-old girls, and one in four, and one in ten 14-year-old uh, boys 
suffered um, had experienced at least one mental health uh, condition. And they found this was actually increasing compared with uh, data ten years previously. Um, so this is obviously like a, an alarming um, sort of statistic. Um, they also found that the absence of of, of mental health difficulty difficulty didn't equate to um, good mental well being, and they made that sort of comparison that way. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of the reasons why this uh, piece of research was so impactful is they had this infographic on the right, um, which sort of highlighted different factors, uh, risk factors, and protective factors associated with either mental health or well being, and they grouped them into these four different categories in the colours you see there. Um, individual characteristics, uh, family, relationships, home life, social economic circumstances, and the wider school and neighbourhood. Um, so this infographic was used, um, you know, through different um, government bodies. So the Department for Education, so the Public uh, Public Health England, were using it in um, sort of establishing their policies and focusing on um, sort of improving mental well-being and, and sort of reducing that risk of mental health among adolescents because as this data showed that this was on the increase um so that's just one example and another another one touching on uh, again reading so this was using um the 1970 british cohort study um so ages 10 and 16 um they asked cohort members um the frequency at which they you know read for pleasure as well as i'm giving a uh, sort of spelling test uh, vocabulary and sort of a mass arithmetic test. They found that those um, cohort members that that did often read for pleasure did better in in all those things compared to those who didn't. That just sort of illustrates that sort of reading for pleasure is good for general cognitive development in in areas not just not just for reading but outside. And uh, one of the advantages of the longitudinal study is they actually um, asked the same question and did these same tests um, when these cohort members were 40 years old. And they found that um, those who said they read for pleasure when they were younger actually did better in those tests again. So that just really highlighted that uh, the, the importance that reading for pleasure um, um, had on participants' uh, cognitive development and their ability in sort of areas just outside of reading. So this was quite an impactful piece of research, had international impact. So um, you know, libraries across the world, I think in New Zealand, Australia, they had sort of these campaigns to promote reading for pleasure uh, due to these sort of um, positive effects that it achieved as a result of this research. So this can be found on this uh, web page at the bottom there if you want to go and read more about that. Um, now we're going to touch at how to actually find longitudinal data on our website. So how do you go actually, how do you go about finding the data sets you want to use? Um, so there's sort of three main ways uh, you can do this. Um, I'm just going to explain all three of them, then I'm going to show you um, a live demo of how to do that on our website. So the first way is through the data catalogue. Um, on our homepage, you'll see the data catalogue there. So we'll show you how to um, find data sets using that, um, not just longitudinal data, but you know any kind of data you want to find. Uh, we also have a find data. So if you didn't want to just search data catalog, but you wanted to maybe explore a bit more different topics, uh, we do have this find data option as well on our website. And finally, we have a variable and question bank. So if you had specific variables in mind or certain questions, um, you can search for these specifically and it will, it will give you results of, of any data sets that have these variables in them. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to show you show you how to do that. Um, so hopefully you should all be able to see um, my screen on the web page, just the UK Data Service homepage. Um, so from here, you'll see um, search our data catalog. So if you just click on search there, um, it will just bring up uh, the data catalog. It's very easy to use. It just shows you at the moment, if you haven't typed anything, it will just display all of the studies we have. So as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, 9,399 studies. And you can also look at the data series. So, um, you know, larger uh, series of data sets rather than specific data sets, for example, understand society as well. So it displays those. And of course, you can filter um, by different topics. Uh, so if you just want to look at health, um, then reduces the number of results there. Uh, data type, if you want to look at cohort and longitudinal studies, um, again, that filter is selected down there. 
and now we can now we're looking at the um cohort longitudinal studies that focus on the topic of health and you can filter further by access type um the country in which the data is a different access type and of course the year as well and you can search for specific terms uh, to sort of filter the results again a bit further if you wanted to search a bit deeper that way so that's the data catalog very simple to use and there's lots of different filters for that uh, so the second second option we talked about was finding data so um, find data you see at the top left uh, of the home page there just just really easy to see find data um, this this first box will take you to the data catalog again the second um, box here is what we want to look at so that's browse and access key data um, so you select browse and access data it just gives you um, a way to access data or look at different data sets by different uh, themes so you can browse by different themes um, maybe education ethnicity housing um, you can browse by data type as well um, so if you just want to look at UK surveys longitudinal studies are on here um, business microdata um, and also we have uh, teaching data sets uh, covered as well um, as well as more general um, ways to search but on here, if we go to browse by data type and click on longitudinal studies, it's just a way to take you to the data catalog. Um, it will have the cohort longitudinal studies filter pre-selected. And as you can see, we've got a number of different um, longitudinal studies here to search through. And the final way we talked about um, was the variable and question bank. So on the data catalog um, underneath the search bar, you'll see this option here says variable and question bank. If you click on that, we'll take to a new sort of search function type uh, display. We can search for specific variables. So any type of variable you're interested in, say if it was um, highest qualification, you can just search for that if you wanted a variable on highest qualification and it will display um, all the types of all the variables that has relate to highest qualification and the data set it can be found in. So obviously we've got a lot of results here. Uh, these are all basically 10,000 different uh, types of variables um, across all the studies. This isn't just low, longitudinal studies. These are all different types of studies. Um, but of course you can filter these um, down a bit more um, if you wanted to. So that's just a, a, a third way to actually, if you had a particular variable or variables in mind or questions in mind, you can use the variable question bank as well. Okay, moving on then to uh, data access. So we mentioned earlier about different data access types. So who can access the data? So essentially the data from the UK data service can be accessed by all registered users. Uh, but how, however, um, it does depend on what other type of data you are accessing. Um, so access conditions can vary depending on the user type. So whether you are based at a UK higher education institution or not, um, where you may be a commercial user. So it, and it also depends on the usage of the project or the project type, project characteristics, whether that be commercial or non-commercial. And also as well, uh, the specific data sets will have uh, certain as uh, data access conditions associated with them, which we'll touch on in, in a moment. So a uh, majority of the data from the UK Data Service can access um, is online um, to data and obviously the metadata surrounding the data sets. If you are, um, if you work for, if you're a student at a, a high education institution, um, you, you, a majority of the data, the EUL data will be available to access for you. And you can just, um, register and download and download and have access to that data. You can get the data in a range of different formats. Um, usually it's SPS or Stata, but you do also have the uh, tab format as well. Databases and spreadsheets are available as well as, you know, word process documents, PDF documents. Um, there's obviously loads of metadata data as well. You'd often get the original questionnaires, data dictionaries, user guides, all those will be available to you um, along with the data set itself. So the step-by-step -step how to access the data. Uh, the first thing you would need to do is register with the UK Data Service. So um, if you're a student at a university, you'd register through your UK um, institutions. That's usually your university 
um, account, uh, email, um, set up a UK DA username and password. You would then agree to the end user license. Uh, select the data you want, um, browse our catalog uh, using the methods we showed before. Um, once you find the data that you like, um, you can click on it. Uh, usually the access data or download an order. You then have to sort of um, associate the data or put the data with a project. You just set up a product online. Um, it's just an easy thing. You'd need to summarize. Um, you know, it, could, it can be a short 30 word description um, of how you're using the data, what you're using the data for, what your project research project is essentially. Uh, then you can download um, the data if it's an EUL data set or if there's any special conditions, um, you can sort of place an order and there'll be certain um, further further conditions or application steps you need to take, but um, you'll be guided through that process when you request access to the data. Um, so the steps are outlined on this page. So we've got a help and our help pages. Um, just on help, you will see a, another web page that takes you to how to download and order data. So essentially it's just instructions on how to uh, download and order, order data. So take you step by step, it's really easy to follow. Um, yeah, and the link's down there. So once you do get a copy of the slides, you can follow the link um, through that. So that just takes you through how to, um, you know, download and order the data essentially. Um, so as mentioned before, we have different access conditions. Um, we have open license, uh, the end user license. So this is when you, um, register and agree to the agree to the end user license before we can access data. Some data sets have special conditions, um, special license data, which is sort of a tier of uh, slightly more restricted access to EUL. Um, there'll be certain permissions associated with that. And then we have the controlled um, secure, secure data access, which is accessed through the uh, secure lab. So this is how they fit into the different three different access levels, uh, open, safeguarded, and controlled there. Um, we did touch on this earlier as well. Uh, so the end user license, so this is what a majority of, of the data sets we have. Um, so in order to gain access to the data, you need to agree to the end user license, essentially. Um, there's, there's quite a lot turned in there, but the main things to consider is to agree to is that you wouldn't share the data with anyone. So once you agree to the end user license and download the data, only you can access that data. So if you had a colleague, for example, you couldn't share the data with them unless they've registered and agreed to the license themselves. So, um, yeah, that's really important um, to consider. Um, generally, you can't use the data for any, any commercial purposes. If, if you are using the URL data for any commercial purpose, you would need to get the appropriate permissions in place for that uh, from the data owner. You wouldn't use the data in any way to identify anyone as individuals, households or organisations. And you must use the correct uh, data citation in your work and any publications you do using the data. Uh, we'll touch on that in the, in the hands-on practical and how to sort of use and find where to find the um, data citation. And there's just other terms as well uh, that are important uh, to consider. And um, of this point about here, about don't disclose your login details to anyone else. Um, yeah, that's pretty common sense school, pretty straightforward. Don't share your login details um, with any colleagues you're working with. Uh, your login, it has to be 100%. Um, only, only you can use that. Um, but there is a link on our website to the EUL, and you'll be uh, you'll be guided to to read that once you go and request access to an EUL data set. Um, also, I have control data, so secure lab data can only be accessed uh, via the secure lab, so these cannot be downloaded. Uh, they're accessed remotely, so you would essentially remote in. Uh, through a VPN into a remote um, virtual desktop uh, secure environment where it's the only place you can access the data. Or alternatively, if you have safe room data, you can you access what are safe room? So there's uh, obviously more access requirements uh, for these data sets. The first being that you'd need to um, become an approved researcher and complete face-to-face -face safe researcher training. You'd need to agree to the service user agreement, uh, breaches penalties policy as well. Um, so the, obviously the applications for these do take a bit longer, obviously because there's a lot more steps that must uh, the application must go through. Uh, you need to have you need the applications are screened by the UK uh, Data Archive, and you'd obviously you would often need to be associated with an institution 
um, having ownership of the data. And access is only granted to researchers who can, um, you know, have um, can justify having access to the data. If your research is doing public good, and you have a good, you know, purpose for accessing data. So these are the things that are considered um, in your secure access application. Access um, is via online, so I mentioned this earlier. So you can access via the virtual private network technology. And any research that you produce, any publications need to go through the output um, process and they're subject to statistical disclosure control. So that's essentially anything that comes out of the secure lab outside of the trusted research environment had to go through our output checks, um, but that'll be covered um, once you undertake the safe research training. Um, the process on that is covered in that training. Um, and then I think we hand you back to Beata to cover exploring data online. Thank you. So, we have an online data browsing and analysis system called Nesta, which allows users to search for, <clears throat> locate, browse, and analyze, and download a wide variety of statistical data within a web browser. However, I would always um, advise that you please download the data properly from the data catalog and analyze the data <clears throat> on, on your um, computer. But Nesta is very, very useful once you have logged in um, to browse the data and get a first feel for it before you even download the data. So I would actually recommend going there, but um, a word of warning is, is needed here. Not all of our data are available in Nesta. So you find a selection there, but not all of them. So don't be misled thinking this is all what we have um, in our collection. We don't. We have many more. It's just um, a small sample of, of the data available in Nesta. So, but what is in there can be browsed very easily. And I will illustrate that in a, in a second. But basically, as I said already before, you need to register um, and that can be done very quickly. I saw in the chat, there was also um, a question how quickly can you register for safeguarded data? Well, it's an online application. So basically you um, you submit your details and uh, and that should be very quickly um, then possible to, to download the data, add it to your basket if you wish. Although basket is misleading because you don't pay for it, it's free. Um, so, and then you can actually download the data and analyze it. You just need to provide, I mean, obviously um, agree to the end user license. Um, read it in detail, but also James has explained uh, quite nicely what exactly you need to agree to, what you can and cannot do. Um, provide some basic information, bits of information about yourself, um, obviously your institutional affiliation, etc. And then you can uh, add the um, data set that you wish to analyze to your project that you have described in more than 30 words, download it and analyze it. So very quickly. Um, once you are in Nesta, and here I just wanted to provide uh, where you need to go. So you see on the very top of that box, the URL that you need to go to in order to find all the information regarding online analysis tools. And um, amongst others, we have Nesta. And that is usually quite popular by our users for a very quick browse, <clears throat> especially for undergraduates, excuse me. Now, <clears throat> this is an example of what you can do uh, in Nesta. This is a simple cross tabulation. I have here looked into parenting skills. So um, how does one feel about their own parenting skills? And I have cross tabulated that by sex. And uh, one of the interesting outcomes is that males in that sample uh, feel um, they are more able uh, and they feel they're um, a very good parent. Um, not as many say that when it comes to the women in that MCS survey, apparently. And another one is if you look at, for example, highest qualification, how that has developed over time. Um, and you can see where there are steep increases and where it goes slightly down, but basically a huge upward trend. Things like this you can very quickly see in, in Nesta. 
Um, however, I would then still recommend download the data and do it properly on your um, on your screen. But a very first good feel for the data you get using NISTA. Okay, back to you, James, for support and resources. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a range of different support and resources available on our website. So we have video tutorials, webinars. We have different data skills modules and resources for students. Uh, case studies, guides, themes. Um, we have advice on managing and sharing data. And we have teaching data sets and teaching data sets resources, as well as the help desk and individual user support. So I'm just going to take you through um, some of these things now. Um, so most of our training and skills um, aspects on our website support um, resources available through the Learning Hub. Um, so just from the home page, if we go to Learning Hub at the top, um, they'll take you through different sort of um, parts of our Learning Hub, depending on what you want to look into. So we have um, aspects on if you're completely new to using data, um, it will take you through bas the, the basics on, on, on using data and on our website as well. We have different data skills modules, so depending on what type of analysis you want to do and what type of data you want to look at, and we have different data skills modules. Um, you have this section for students um, and as well as different data types. So it goes into the different types of data, where it's survey data, international, qualitative, and there's also one on longitudinal data as well. Um, so this is a longitudinal data skills module. Um, it gives you an introduction to work with longitudinal data. I think it takes about two hours um, to do um, from start to finish, but you can sort of save your progress and come back to it later. Um, so it takes you through what, what longitudinal data is, how to find it, um, there's little quizzes throughout to check your understanding. Um, the examples are in SPSS, um, but you can do the examples in whatever um, statistical software you like to use. And it uses the um, understanding society data set um, the examples are from that and you could do get a small certificate on completion as well so that's if you're sort of new want to have a nice introduction to the work of longitudinal data um i do recommend this longitudinal data skills module and we do have the link to it um on the, on the slide there as well the case studies um on this on the home page we do have an, a section on impact uh, one part of this is the case study so if you wanted to see um, case studies of how research using the UK data service um, data sets has actually impacted policy or um, impacted aspects in, in the real world, um, you can use, you can look at the case studies web page. Um, so initially when you go on it, it does show you different um, case studies by different topics and themes. So we have business, business and economy, environment and sustainability, and then health and well-being. But if you did want to browse case studies um, yourself and look into it further, they do have a browse all case studies um, at the top as well. So when you click on that browsing case studies, it would actually show you um, all the different case studies we have. So these case studies are sort of um, produced throughout the year. Um, and they just really highlight um, really key pieces of research um, using UK data service data that has sort of impacted um, you know, areas outside of academia, whether that's public policy or areas such as that. Um, so they're very, very, very interesting and a lot of work has been put in, into these. So please do um, do have a look and read through uh, the case studies. So it's not just longitudinal data, so that's, you know, all, they encompass all data um, across the UK that are held by the UK Data Service. So as I mentioned before, um, we do have teaching, teaching resources. So uh, as part of our learning hub, um, there's an aspect on teaching of the data set, uh, teaching with real data. Um, so from here, we'll tell you different types of, of you know, access conditions and, and use for using the data set for teaching. It'll we'll take you through different teaching data sets and different teaching resources, depending on the type of data and some things to, some guidelines to consider, um, such as data management and things like that. So if you, if you want to, uh, teach using the data then please do look at this aspect of the learning hub because that's a really good resource um and again if you want to search for teaching data sets um you know longitudinal specific teaching data sets if you go on our data catalog and just type teaching data set in and then you filter the results by the cohort longitudinal studies 
which will actually give you um, some examples of longitudinal studies, um, teaching data set versions of longitudinal studies. So for example, we've got the Understand Society uh, COVID-19 study teaching data set there. Um, and then also have the help help page. So the top right, you'd have help. So if there's anything you're unsure about or you need help, this this is the best page to go because it just outlines the different aspects of of um, you know using the service. So you may have issues with registration. Uh, hopefully you'll find your answer in there. Advice for new users, um, how to get and access data. We have different um, ways that shows you how to access data in that section. And also, if you are a Secure Lab user, uh, there's sort of FAQs and questions and answers in the Secure Lab section there. So if, if you ever need help for anything, um, go on ukdataservice.ac.uk slash help. This is the best place uh, to go initially, and hopefully you'll find an answer to your to your query on this page. Um, we do have a specific um, page for longitudinal data in the help uh in the help web pages. So um, this is just on help, and then you'll find a section for longitudinal data. And it will take you to this page on longitudinal data and studies. And it will just outline the main um, sort of longitudinal data sets, uh, give you a brief overview, overview of them, and it will take you through, it will give you the link to actually go and access that data. So if you want a nice overview of longitudinal data, uh, I do recommend this help page as well. So that's just uh, UK Data Service help and search through the data types and then you find the longitudinal data studies. So um, yeah, that's a resource there. I think that comes to the end of the uh, initial slides. We would like to now um, proceed with a hands-on session. We just have 15 minutes left, so that's not uh, a lot of time, but I think it might be actually quite useful to to basically uh, apply what you have learned so far. Okay, whoever is leaving now, thank you very much and goodbye. For the others, um, please have a look at our first task slide. We would like you to actually use the data catalog to filter um, all cohort and longitudinal studies. And then there are a couple of questions and James will guide you through that. Yeah, so um, using the data catalog, so what we showed earlier um, on our website, um, we just want you to find answers to these questions here. So the first one is, how many results for cohort and longitudinal studies are there being displayed? So if you go on the data catalog and apply that filter for cohort and longitudinal studies, um, how many longitudinal studies do you get? What number of results it's showing, essentially? Uh, second one, how many cohort longitudinal studies cover the topic of society and culture? So if you filtered this, filtered these results a bit further, how many longitudinal studies um, come under this, this topic of society and culture? Um, third question is how many of these data sets now are come under the safeguarded access conditions and also cover the United Kingdom. So if you apply those two filters, how many results are you left with? And then um, finally, if you do all those questions correctly, what's the first page, what's the first result um, that comes up? So what's the, the study name and study number um, for this page? And then a final question, if you have time or you want to at the end, can you use this catalog uh, to find any longitudinal data set that will be useful for your research. So we had that question on Northern Ireland, so you could use it to search for any Northern Ireland data sets, for example. Um, so I'll give you a couple of minutes to, to complete this task. So we'll go through the answers. Um, you don't have, to, don't have to type the answers any, in anywhere. It's just to, just to really get used to using the data catalogue so we can run through the answers on the following slide, and then you can just sort of... Um, just check with them to see if you've got uh, the correct correct ones.
Okay, just thinking of the time as we've got a few more um, little tasks to do, we've only got about 10 minutes left. Um, I'll just show you the answers here. Um, so don't worry if you haven't got them all. Um, I will show you how to do this um, just quickly as well. So the first one, how many results for current longitudinal studies? So if you filtered that, it should have been 1,147. And then um, how many under society and culture? That's 297. So looking at safeguarded and covers the United Kingdom, so that's 94. And the top um, result for this page would have been the Understand Society Special Licence with the census um, 2011 LSOA identifiers in them. So that's study number 7248. Um, so just showing how to do that um, using the catalogue. So if we just search on the catalogue and then applied that filter um, for a data type, leaves us with a 1147 result. So these are all the all the longitudinal studies we have in our collection. Um, and then we did the topic of society and culture. So, you know, filtering that a bit more, we've got 297 results. And then if we filtered by the access of safeguarded, as well as, you know, looking at the country of the United Kingdom, gives us with the 94, and then the top result there was study number 7248. Um, so yeah, so that's just a, just a couple little quiz questions, just to have a go at using the data catalog and different ways you can search uh, for data, data using that. So hopefully, um, yeah, when you get time later on today, you can use the catalog and find some data sets um, that'll be useful for your research and your studies. Um, so I hope that is you there. Uh, and then I'm going to pass you back to Bart to cover the next uh, few tasks, the practical. Yeah. So the next task will be to find the data citation for study number 6614. And there's a small hint in brackets that you can find it under details, the top details. And I think you will have found, hopefully, this citation. Um, and James, because you're anyway sharing your screen, could you quickly please show them where to find the uh, data citation for 6614? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the first thing you'd need to do is... Uh, well, we know already 6614, yeah. Could find it. Yeah, so from this page, uh, it's under the details section. So we know it's on this page, and it's just just right there on the first. When you go to documentation, sorry, um, it's uh, basically up um, a little bit up, and then you see the tab here, documentation. Mm -hmm. And then we will find the data citation file in here. Um, that's a bit um, a little bit tricky because it's so many files actually. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's not a very good. Um, it's called data citation file. The, uh, uh, yeah. And basically here you, you can see um, University of Essex Institute for Social Economic Research and the citation for this data. So it's the second paragraph. You basically just copy and paste that bit. And that is exactly what you will need for your references section. So um, exactly. Thank you very much for highlighting. Um, so this is, this is all. And it's a matter of copying and pasting um, the data citation. And you have your reference ready. Okay, so that was that task. Okay. And I think we have some more, but we also have just five minutes. So uh, let's see how much is possible. So basically, that's an online analysis task. Um, and you are very welcome because, as we said, we have the slides available after this event um, on our uh, website. And you could actually do this task at your own leisure if you want. 
and you will then also actually see whether you you got it right that is actually quite a nice little exercise so basically what you would need to do is here to log in or to register and if you need to register then obviously that will take up some minutes of your time and you might not be able to proceed now but anyway I would highly, I would actually encourage you to register if you haven't done so yet with the UK Data Service in any case. Um, and then you would go to Nesta and you would click on Teaching Data Sets. And then you select the BHPS, the particular one here, the Waves 1 to 11. And um, go to Health and be Health Behavior, Health Status over last 12 months. Um, and then the question is, what percentage of respondents reported excellent, good, fair, poor, and very poor health? That is the question. And actually, we will not reveal it yet, because maybe you can you can actually use your last four minutes to get to the answer. And if so, please, can you then type your answer into the chat? no one so far but i mean it's a few steps so i understand that might take a while let's give it until 28 past 11 then we need to wrap up i'm afraid but please you can also finish that afterwards and then compare whether your results match what the outcome should be. Yeah, half more minute. Okay, so this is what you would find actually. Um, this is how your your uh, screen should look like when you go to the result. And please feel free to compare that at your own leisure afterwards. Our contact details, um, you can um, <clears throat> basically find us via these channels. And otherwise, as we said before, if you have any particular questions, um, go to uh, the help desk link and email us. We're looking forward to hearing from you and we hope this was very helpful. Enjoy the rest of your day and thank you very much.